G'day, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. We're loving the feedback, listeners, so keep it coming in. Uh, today's episode, we are talking about, it's going to be collaboration over competition, mate. Um, I mean, I, I had the chance to jump on your podcast recently, uh, and I'm, I'm talking to Joe Tucker from Principles Property. Property Principles. Property Principles. <laughs> I knew I'd get that right. Or I had a 50-50 <laughs> chance. Sorry about that. Um, but, mate, I, I guess we're going to go into, we'll go into your journey in just a tick. Uh, but I guess where, where our paths really crossed is, you know, on Facebook, I've seen your, your group that has grown. I'm probably saying at a point it's exploded. Yeah. Uh, what are we seeing at like 70, well, yeah, 75. Yeah. 75, so it's 000. Australia's largest property investment group. It's actually very similar to this name. So I feel like you owe me, I feel like I own some rights to this. We have Oz property investors. You have Australian property investment. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> Mine's just trademarked though. So Okay. Ours is not <laughs> trademarked. I don't know. I can speak to some legal people about Please that. Please do not take it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I think that's the beauty of uh, when we connected, which is, hey, we're definitely serving a similar type of audience. Uh, the the content, the messaging that we're putting out comes from a place of love going, how do we help people on the journey? We are on the journey ourselves. And yeah. we're just being about what you guys are doing personally in your own portfolio, same as Bernadette, my wife, uh, and our team, where we're literally trying to walk the walk and talk the talk. And if we're doing it, we're going to be in trenches with the people that we're serving in our communities as well. So I think what you're not, I think what you've definitely done is attracted a large amount of Australians who are eager and hungry to grow their own portfolios. And they come into a place where they can be around like-minded individuals. Well, that's the whole point. It's all just about adding value to people and getting getting them all together in a community where it's a safe environment. Yeah. Because this is the problem. When I was starting my property investment journey, we had very few podcasts, very few shows, very no, the Facebook groups didn't even exist. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is have a community where we filter out all the house and land spruikers, all the mm. off-the-plan crap, and we're just focusing in on great, what do what are we doing? And then sharing what we're doing. And then there's other experts in there like yourself, right? We're, I'm not an expert mortgage broker. I will bring on expert mortgage brokers and unpack their value. And each week we do that. And yeah. it's, it's how we create value. And it's how it's gotten so big, right? It's just by showing up. That's exactly it. I think it, to, when I started, which is I couldn't even talk really about the finance side being a mortgage broker. I've got to stay in my lane and not give advice. And I want to bring in you know professionals that were what we said best in breed. Yeah. And so people have joined us on the journey going, I mean, with some incredible names that have come on, just like you have as well. Yeah. Going, they just want to pass the baton on to the next stage of investors because they've done it themselves and they have a real abundance mindset to go, I just want to help more people. They're giving up their time. They're not charging for it when they come on. And it's very much a, I don't want to say a noble gesture, but it's a very pay it forward type mentality. Yeah. Yeah. There are hundreds of, there are thousands of deals out there. Um, you can, you know, someone would say, oh, you've got a group of 75,000 people and you're helping them, you know, all buy properties. Is there competition? Well, mm. yeah, but there are thousands of deals out there. So if you don't get that one, you'll get the next one. Right. Um, and it's just how do you help these guys go from from zero? Because that's the biggest step. Zero to one is the hardest thing. And then, you know, as you get the second one, and it's the most important as well. The first one is the most important because that sets the portfolio up. And then you start to get to momentum. Yeah. Uh, you start to build your team. And that's the most, one of the things that you mentioned, I, we're probably going to chat to team a little bit later, but is like you're driving your investment vehicle, right? A property investor out there is driving that vehicle. And then your job is to fill it with experts and they all have their correct seat. You know, you've got your mortgage broker in there. You've got your buyer's agents. You've got your accountants. You've got your solicitors. And uh, when you're driving that vehicle along, you're in control. You have the keys and you don't want to, you don't want to hand your keys over mm -hmm. to um, somebody else entirely. You need to get to a level of knowledge that you can, hey, I've got a question about this. What does this mean? How does this work? And feel comfortable to be able to do that. Um, because I've seen, when we see people just hand over the keys, they do these house and lands, they do the off the plans, they do all this whole tax saving thing. And it doesn't yeah. really, it's not successful. It doesn't work well for them. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, that's what you should be doing. Filling your vehicle with qualified experts that are trying to grow you and that are going down the same path as you, or that you're trying to replicate that path, right? You see them, Hey, you know, you've got, you know, $6 million worth of property. How do I get to $6 million worth of property? Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting analogy that you use driving the vehicle, because that implies that there's one person in the driver's seat. Mm. When we have couples, yeah. you now got two drivers. I was like one of those, like those, those two drivers <laughs> cars, the one that has the brake <laughs> and the wheel. Well, that's exactly it. Cause one partner is <laughs> effectively so going to become the brake. Yeah. Um, and especially when I deal with couples, one, one of the 
uh, one of the individuals has taken the lead. They've listened to the podcast. They've researched the buyer's agents. They've looked at the strategy. They've done their numbers. They've talked to a broker, for example, and now they've brought the partner in going, hey, look at all the work that I've done. We should buy a property. Yeah. And they're going, whoa, 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 easy tiger. What are you talking about? We're going to rip the equity out of our home. Yeah. This is the <laughs> family home that we've got. Yeah. You're going to put $20,000 or whatever a buyer's agent charges. We're going to give them that much money to go and buy an investment property. We need to slow down here. It takes the wind out of that person's sales as well. So there's naturally, you know, you've had conversations where one person's you know, spent, you know, call it even the 10,000 hour rule. Yeah. They spend that much time engaging with the content, getting a strategy, find the right team yeah. for then the partner to become the handbrake. Yeah. Well, and, but also what's the risk of not, of doing nothing? That's the biggest thing. What is the risk of doing nothing? But you need to, I guess that's a little tip for anyone that is in a relationship. Obviously this is not a relationship podcast. But I think <laughs> in, investing in property is highly emotive. And so Definitely. when people say leave emotion at the door, I'm like, I can't no, no. BS on that because no. we're talking about going to the land of the unknown, buying a property, not knowing because past, you know what they say, past performance is no indication of future performance, whatever yeah, they yeah. have. And we're literally going to put our trust and faith in something that look, logically it makes sense. Yeah. We've plenty of people have made money. We can see it and they're, and they're showing us how they've built it. Emotionally it's going, Hey, mm. we're going to risk what we've built already for the promise of a brighter future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just, I think you need to take your partner as kick, like maybe not kicking and screaming along the journey with you. So give them some more podcasts that are a little bit easier to listen to that aren't so advanced, that aren't so difficult. Um, and then also what really worked out for me was to paint the picture of looking forward of where will I end up if I continue on the path that I'm continuing on now, right? Uh, you know, previous to this, I was a head of sales of a legal tech startup. I loved it. It was the best, best job ever. Um, but then I kind of looked forward. Okay, great. What, you know, what is a hundred and what can I do with, my investing and and if I you know you then look 20 30 40 years down the line where where are your models um because if I just keep saving I don't know 20 30 grand a month a a month Jesus that'd be nice a year what can I do with that and how can I get into that next asset and you can't you've just got to you've got to unfortunately take some risk to get uh things but there's not all as we were saying before like uh, property investing is pretty forgiving like it is a forgiving asset as long as you do it correctly. You can make a lot of money uh, up front. Like we're going to probably chat to some clients that I've recently worked with where I think we created like 400 and something. Oh, actually, I'll find the numbers out. Yeah, so just if you're listening here and you, you haven't come across Joe uh, Tucker uh, with his business, buyer's agent is very much the core focus of what you do. Um, yeah, you got your community there as well. you got a great podcast that you put out. So we'll put all, we'll put all the links uh, if you do want to find out more information about Joe and, and him coming on as a guest today. Uh, I'll also include the um, previous episode that I did when I featured on your podcast as well. Just oh, you so, did great. I loved it. Oh, appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Super. And also Bernie as well. Uh, and so Bernadette. I don't know. Bernadette. Uh, yeah, it was wife. cool. Because yeah. you guys are like the, the power team, right? One of the things that you have to do is have a team that can communicate really well. And you have yourself, mortgage broker extraordinaire, uh, and also Bernie, who's a mortgage broker extraordinaire, but also has the accounting background as mm-hmm. well. And obviously she's not giving you the accounting advice and things like that, but having both hats on, mm-hmm. you, you can get a little bit more creative. You can start talking about trusts and getting getting to that next level of, of property uh, investing because there is going to be some ceilings. There are going to be some, there are tools. I can't give any advice on trusts. This is an accountant's role. But you, you need to be speaking to your broker, your accountant, your mortgage. You need your A-team all in the car talking together rather than individual silos sp- spread out. Yeah. So someone comes to me and they go, look, I've got $400,000 of equity. Now you're right. So if you're listening to this and you go, I've got a million-dollar property, $600,000 loan, yes, you have $400,000 of total equity. The bank will deem that you've got to go up to 80% against the value of your million dollars, which means you can drop to $800,000, i.e. you now have $200,000 worth of available or usable equity. So if we get this terminology right, and you may be a more advanced investor, this episode is really going to kind of bring it back a little bit. Some of our newer investors or slightly inexperienced, okay, as a reference point. So when we talk about equity, we're talking about the difference between 80% of the value of the home, less your current mortgage, Okay. Questions then come up is around redraw, for example, and offsets. That's something I will deal on a case-by-case basis in terms of how much you have there. But let's keep it very simple for this example. Yeah. What happens here is you've got a $200,000 equity uh, loan that you can draw out that what we will uh, generally say is, 
well, why don't you use that to go and split maybe across two investment properties? Now, if you're listening in Sydney, the first thing you do is go, <laughs> hang on, where am I going to buy this property for sub a million dollars as an yeah. investment property? Well, uh, spoiler alert, you're not buying in New South Wales. <laughs> uh, you're going to look at an interstate market, which is where some, you know, we engage a buyer's agent, refer out, going, here's a couple of buyer's agents, find out who you feel you know, most comfortable with. Then it comes across to yourself, Joe, yeah. which is, hey, look, here's the equity that you've got to work with. Yeah. Here's how much your potential borrowing capacity is. So put that together and go, how much are we looking to buy an investment property and then look, look at the return and the cash flow on that as well. Yeah. So take me through, when you have those initial conversations, how does that play out from your perspective? Well, it comes down to just utilization of asset, right? Because what, what any investor, because I want to break it down as simple as possible, is all we have as property investors is cash and equity on one hand and borrowing ability and serviceability on the other. Yeah. And these two are always in flux and always changing as your portfolio scales and grow. So if you're a, a property, in, no, you're not a property investor. You just bought your PPOR. You've been paying it off for the last 10 years. You, it's, you know, you bought in Sydney, you bought it for a mil. It's now worth, you know, whatever that example two you mil, just gave, yeah. right? Two mil, um, 80% of that. What, what does that look like? Uh, 1.6 mil. Yeah, 1.6 mil, a million dollars worth of, let's just say debt. That's $600,000 of usable equity. You have such a bigger unfair advantage compared to anybody else out there because there are so many people that try to build their deposit, but you have lazy equity just sat there ready to go. So you, you, um, you have an unfair advantage to everyone. So as a property investor, you should start, like if you've got usable equity, you should be using it Correct. because it's it's value that is stored that is just sitting there redundant if you're just kind of paying off the debt. Now, everyone wants a paid off PPOR, but the way I'm, what I'm getting a lot more kind of busy professionals are like, actually, I want to be buying a spectacular Sydney home. So I want to build, I know progressing forward, I can't do that. I need to be building a portfolio outside of, uh, outside of Sydney. Uh, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever your goal is, then sell down that portfolio and then buy my Sydney home. So everyone's goal is completely different. So this is where it kind of comes into a strategy session. So we have a, um, a, a tech-enabled platform and we have a qualified property investment advisor. We take that step back before you come to me and say, great, I want to buy a property. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What assets, resources, liabilities, what things have you got here? And where do you want to go? Because if you say, Joe, I want to retire in three years on $180,000, the computer and the qualified is going to be like, D -d 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 -three. no, that's impossible. However, this is what five years will look like. This is what 10 years could look like. This is what 15, 20, 30 years could look like um, if you go down a, a different path. Now, if you want $180,000, you may actually be able to do that in three years if you're incredibly aggressive and doing property developments and this and this, all this crazy stuff but you need to be realistic about what you're trying to achieve uh, and the goal. So it kind of, that's where we start. We, we try and balance based on reality. Okay. Well, your serviceability is debt to income ratio. I'm going to be a little bit too deep, but you know, uh, six time income, you can borrow X amount of dollars. Let's allocate this with the help of the broker to make sure that um, we're getting the right uh, layer. Um, but also the key I think is making sure this next property that we're purchasing doesn't screw us up for the following one. So you don't need to mark yeah. out the next 100 purchases, the next 20 purchases. It's what does this next property need to be to ensure that I can continue my property investing and journey on the next one. Then when you get to the next one, you then have the clarity about, okay, what does this next one need to be to allow us to get to the yeah. next one? And I think that's conversations that, again, we're having quite a lot of going, I want to map out the next four or five acquisitions. Yep. Like, I love that. It's music to my ears. However, yeah. We're at like one property. We just need to focus on getting to the next one. It's putting one foot in front of the other. I know we've got ambitions and I'm, I'm such an enabler. I, I really want people to grow. I want, I want to work with people that are getting, you know, 10 plus properties in their portfolio. But the journey means we need to take one, get to the next step. And really the way we're going to dial this up is income. Yeah. Yep. We can sit here and talk about trusts. And I know that's the flavor of, flavor of the month. And we talk about SMSFs as well. They are tools in your tool belt. They are not the superpowers. They're going to grow and scale your portfolio. So when you be thinking about how are you going to ratchet up your income, income is going to help you drive up borrowing capacity, asset selection, which means we get the equity uplift that then is going to give you more equity on tap to then go on um, fuel for future purchases. And then we're going to talk about choosing the right asset because if you choose the wrong, wrong asset, you can have all the best laid plans in terms of the next two, three acquisitions. But if you're bought in the wrong location, it doesn't get you the growth. Cash flows hemorrhaging, for example, all those plans are 
goes to the waist. Nothing, yeah. Right? It's kind of like going up Mount Everest, right, mm-hmm. without a Sherpa. You're going up this path and then you might find yourself two years down the line and you get to a dead end you're like, oh, crap, I need to walk all the way back down to the start and restart it all, all over again. And that's what I'm seeing with people that have done the whole house and land and off the plan. They, they just say, I can do this all by myself. I can't, I can't do business all by myself. I can't do property investing all by myself. You need to embrace a, a team of people that are going to help you, but listen to them for their expertise. Yeah. I'm going to listen to the Sherpa that knows all about the croupons and you know the ladder thing and all the crazy <laughs> stuff and ice climbing. I'll chat to him about that. And it's the same with kind of property investing. So you mentioned a couple of times house and land and off the plan. Yeah. Um, and so for someone listening, I've, I've had plenty of clients that have, you know, made the errors I've, I've bought off the plan uh, as well so i've seen it firsthand um why is it not an ideal part of a portfolio what comes property investing is about creating value um and it's about finding an asset that is under undervalued in an area that has uh, a, a low supply and a high demand when you build a 300 unit complex your asset is exactly the same as everybody else's asset um, and it's on a small parcel of land. That 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 three hundred unit block may be on a thousand square meters or two thousand square meters, and so you own a, a minor percentage. So it's land to asset value that you're looking for. So buying, not I'm not saying all units are bad. Like I live in a unit, uh, I own the unit, and it's it's done really well because it's in a smaller complex. So you're trying to up that uh, land to asset ratio. And same with the house and lands. If you're buying a house and land on the outskirts of the middle of nowhere, it's going to take time. There is more. There's there's 500 properties that are identical to yours, mm. and they're all coming online over the next three five years. So there is not enough demand to outweigh the supply. So that's why you want to be buying established properties in established neighborhoods. And to to see the value of this, all you have to do is look at a city on a map, and zoom really far into the middle of the city, and you'll start to see units and skyscrapers and things. And then as you get further out, further out, it'll be, you know, uh, duplexes and townhouses and things like that. And then it'll get even smaller to individual dwellings and then it will just be vacant land. So if you're just buying the vacant land, it's going to take time for that value to kind of uh, make sense. But the problem is, uh, (laughs) the challenge is over the past couple of years, house and land packages and things, everything has risen. So Mm -hmm. there is still still value there. I'm not saying that you can't make money in those things. It's just... It's playing the game on hard mode. So you're you're buying an asset that's too – it's going to be very difficult to make money uh, from unless you're the top 1% investor of those assets. So you can absolutely do it. I would just say why focus on the hard stuff when you yeah. can get the property get the property that's proven to, to do well. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Again, you mentioned at the very start something around adding value. So, again, in our conversations, we're trying to add value. You can also do the same in a property context as well, uh, probably the biggest part of our conversations with clients now is how are they adding value? Yeah, and really, some are trying good. to really force it, for example. Some are naturally creating uh, the extra value. So I'll give this some context here as well. So what you could potentially do is minor renovations, that means flooring, painting, uh, updating kitchen or bathroom, the, the high value areas, uh, not, not overcapitalizing, so not overspending on it, go in there, improve it, gets one uh, better rental return, but two, then you get a valuer coming through, okay, I can revalue and see the the improvement that you've made on this property. So that's one. The other one is you go a little bit more advanced and they're putting a second dwelling on there, helps from a cash flow perspective, call it a granny flat or a second dwelling, or even subdividing some of these bigger blocks, for example, and taking the cash when they go to sell. So these are just some examples that we're talking about how to add value. I know you've probably done a few of these in your time. So take me through maybe a couple of examples where you've gone and go, hey, this is an opportunity. Yeah. Let's call it an ugly duckling, for example, of a property. And That's people, what we call them. <laughs> people, are, and we've had a few come across our desk when people go through buyer's agents going, look, it's going to take you about 30, 40 grand of, of like work. But we're buying under market value. We're going to do some work and it's going to get revalued much higher as well. Correct. So take me through this approach because it, I guess it does take a little bit more capital. The yep. property may be rented out not rented out for a short time as well. Yeah. So it's probably just going to test your cash flows on a personal level yeah, as cor- well. Yeah, correct. I mean, I mean, what what a lot of people do is they think they need to save for a deposit, right? If you've got that lazy equity just sitting there, you've got so much value over everybody else, you can get that money out into cash and then spend that on a property, but also then spend it on a renovation. But you need to be a bit more strategic in what you're trying to acquire. So what we like to do is acquire ugly duckling assets 
depending on what the client actually needs. So what we could do is buy an ugly duckling right now that needs work right now because the client needs instant equity, right? So a, a prime example is we bought a property for $595,000 in in, um, in Queensland. We paid 595. It was a three bed, one bath property, but we had an extra laundry and an extra living room. All we did is we spent $30,000 on a renovation and then that took it from, uh, what did it take you? So three bed, one bath to a four bed, two bath. A four bed, two bath. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we do this is because it forces the valuer's hand. When the valuer is looking at your property and you do a kitchen renovation, don't get me wrong, kitchen renovations are are great. They add a little bit of value. Um, But the best by far, the lowest hanging fruit is converting it from a a two bed to a three bed or a three bed to a four bed. Well, you think about it, you're moving yourself into that next rung. So you look at the median price of the three bed in that area Look at the median value for a four bedder, and there's a sizable jump. Yep. There's not a thirty thousand dollar increment from the three bedder to a four bedder, especially when you're moving the needle from a three bed one bath to what I call a sweet spot, which is four bedroom two bath. Like that is a sweet spot for Australian households. I can tell that yep. with two small kids. <laughs> a four bedroom two bath is the absolute sweet spot for a family. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and you guys can do it right now. <clears throat> Keep this keep this tab open, <laughs> but um, if you go on to domain.com.au, go to research and then type in your suburb and then it will say, you know, I live in Cronulla, right? Cronulla, you'll see a three-bedroom property, probably not a good example because it's quite high value property, uh, but yeah, go to any suburb of where you live and the three-bed will be worth $500,000 and the four-bed will be worth uh, $650,000. So that's exactly what we did. So we bought this property for this client. He paid five hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. He spent forty thousand dollars on a on uh, the renovation. It took it took three and a half weeks, uh, and then he just got it revalued at six hundred eighty thousand dollars. So we're talking five ninety-five plus the thirty six twenty-five, but now revalued at six eighty-five. Correct. Yeah, six eighty. So he so he he spent forty thousand uh, dollars and he got a nice little uptick. So he spent a dollar and he got two dollars back. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to and that's allowing him to then go for the next one, right? So he he deliberately spent that forty thousand dollars, knowing that he would remove it from his cash pool, but he would open up the equity pool, mm. which allows him to go again. So you need to be a little bit strategic. But what you can do is um uh you the big point is you don't need to be an expert right now. You don't need to be an expert in renovation. You don't need to be an expert in subdivision. But if you can buy uh, properties that have value into the future, that's where the that's kind of where the gold comes in. So I call it frozen equity. So if you've got a property that you can add a three bed and a, to a four bed and add a bathroom to, don't bother. Just keep it there. If you don't need the cash flow, if you don't need the equity – keep that potential there and then start building and acquiring assets. And then even better if you can have the ability to add a granny flat or you can have the ability to subdivide. Don't get scared of subdivision. Mm. Um, I buy properties that have subdivision potential all the time because I'm freezing that equity for that client. So it's all about like I guess in anything in life, you're paid proportionally to the problem that you're solving. So that's a part of the house and land problem is you're buying the fully done up, perfect, pretty, you are buying the end product. But if you can buy an ugly duckling, that is a problem. It's not as pretty. It's not as valuable. Yeah. So if you do the value and you spend the money to <clears throat> convert that problem, you will get paid <clears throat> in proportion to that. So if you can uh, – what, what what's the biggest problem we have right now in Australia? A supply shortage of properties. So if you can buy a property and then subdivide off a block, um, happy days. That means you're creating value. You don't need to be an expert in subdivision right now. Give yourself 5, 10, 15 years to be able to do that stuff and then do it and then unlock your equity. Um, But the whole point of this is kind of like we build these portfolios. Like I'll give you – you were like, hey, Joe, give me some examples, like real-world numbers of some clients and what it all kind of looks like. So um, I have a client here that we're going to talk in two years, right? So August 22, so that's one year, 11 months ago, we bought him a property in WA. We paid $540,000 for it. Now – it was uh, an ugly duckling, but it was also an awesome buy because online it was listed as a three bed, one bath, um, and it was a dodgy eight, like not dodgy, it's probably not the right word. An agent that is better to buy from, and it actually turned out that they had two bathrooms and they did an extension, and the agent actually didn't. He just listed it off market. He called me up, Joe, I've got this deal. I just listed it. I haven't been to the property. Do you want to buy it? RP Data says it's worth X. Do you want to buy it at this? I'm like, great, let's see it. Let's do the inspection. Turns out it's a four bed, two bath. 
So automatically, the client's already bought it for 540. It's now a four bed, two bath property. So we um, that was one year, 11 months ago. That got revalued at $750,000. 540 to 750 is $210,000 worth of value just because it's well the most important thing is the area that you choose mm. right if i bought this in an asset in a market that's going down these value adds so market is the most important thing where you're buying and then matching the the quality asset to that area so that's what that's two hundred and ten thousand dollars. that has the potential to be able to subdivide as well wow he's not doing that he's keeping that to the side um the other one so this is the same guy um so this guy here uh, met husband and wife team. Um, they're absolute legends. The down to earth, normal, everyday Aussies that are just trying to unlock the equity. They unlock the equity that they have in their um, PPOR, and they're using that equity to buy in this portfolio. So that's how they kind of got started. Um, so 30th of May, 23, one year, one month ago, we bought another property for 510 thousand. That's now worth 660 thousand. So that's 150 thousand dollars worth of equity. Uh, again, subdividable, one into two. They're going to. They're actually in the process of doing just, that one. Sorry, mate. Just <clears throat> So you're saying 150K in 13 months. So if you're listening here, that's 10K a month. And most families I speak True. to, and you're saying, look, they're, uh, I don't want to be uh, diminished, but you said they're an average. Every, yeah. Every, average, every day. A, average family. So you take a median income of say, I don't know, combined household income somewhere 150 onwards, for example, median incomes. They can't save one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in thirteen months, yeah. And that's where I talk about the unfair advantage in property. Going, there's no way you possibly could have saved that much. Yeah, and property is a bit like full savings. And you go, well, hang on, they've had to do stamp duty, buyers agents, and then you know if they go to sell, there's some real estate costs. But no one's buying to hold and sell for twelve in twelve months time, thirteen months time. So yeah. go with me on the example. <laughs> zoom out a little bit and say the the, the principle is over that time they're realizing nearly ten thousand more than ten thousand dollars a month. You just physically can't save that. So it's very much like forced savings yeah. in the market that when they go to sell it, naturally it won't keep at this pace for five years, but it's given them this rolling start to go the heavy lifting side at the very start. Yeah, The growth has been there and now it's a point of just managing and maintaining at some point as well. Yeah, correct. I mean, the the other thing to mention is um, these acquisitions, we we created a strategy over, over um, 15 years and it was one purchase today, which is that first purchase, then another one in three years and another one in four years because we were factoring 5% growth. But this is why you need a flexible changing portfolio, uh, flexible changing strategy because the growth came. So we're like, cool, we're now ready to go for the next one. It's so you then, forward, it's brought those plans it's brought years the plans, forward. Yeah, yeah, brought it forward. Yeah. Um, so some of the did some of them did need a little bit of renovation, but nothing above, you know, thirty thousand dollars or anything awesome. like that. Uh, and then the third one we bought in uh, Jan seven months ago, 465000 That's now 525000 So that's a 60K. So we've made these guys $420,000, but it's because they took action. It's because they saw the equity that they had. They looked forward and projected, I don't think I'm going to be able to retire with what I want. So my goal, my, our, the whole point of our buyer's agency goal is to get as many people off the pension. We don't want anyone Absolutely. on the pension. We want to build scalable uh, portfolio. So if, if you're banking on the pension, you've got to say with all due respect. Run the numbers though. I've, <laughs> run the numbers. But since I've started working, I've got paid super. Um, yeah. So there's no pension for me at all because that's what superannuation is, is effectively for. It's like lack of government support. We're forward yeah. planning for the planning seeds for our, our retirement. There's no way a pension is going to support you, nor should it be a crutch, and nor should you even bank on it because if that's what superannuation was given to you for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but also, so they'll, some, phase out, they'll phase out a pension at some point. Eventually. Asset yeah. tested, you weren't even qualified for it. Mm. So true. you're not even, to me, I'm like, if you're banking on that, you've missed the point. <laughs> There's 100%. absolutely no way that someone on a six figure income these days should be thinking about being on a pension. The way that the, anal the, the breakdown that I'm talking to people is, you trade your time for a paycheck, so that's yeah. your active. So you go to work, you pay AYG or salaried, you go to work to get your income. Yeah. Now people do two, one or two things. They either save it yeah. and invest or they spend it on lifestyle. Yeah. The that ones lifestyle that are spending creep, it. Right? Yeah. It creeps up. You're, you're earning 120000 Great. I've got a $10,000 pay rise. Boom. That $10,000 now goes into my lifestyle. You're now living on 130k, and it's like the the watch gets expensive. I've said it plenty of times before. The watch gets more expensive. The clothes get more expensive. I've found as over time that more I've earned, 
the less I've spent on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the less I've spent on it. Um, and it's almost like a badge of honor how cheap I can buy stuff now. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and I'm like, I'm kind of going the other way, going against the grain. And that's what you've got to be able to do mentally take yourself to that place where it's very hard, uh, especially in a corporate role. For example, a lot of our clients do work, you know, in corporate roles and it's very hard to turn up to the office in a not nice suit or nice clothing, for example. So there is a challenge there. I say hook into the sales, buy what you can when you can and try and you know, save a good portion. But to go back to this example, so you get your salary, you have your, your minimum or your living expenses, save a portion and then that portion that you invest in property or whatever you're going to invest in, once that starts to reap you some rewards, i.e. capital growth or some cash flow, then that can fund things like a car or a watch, for example. And yeah. you're not paying out of pocket. Your investments have now given you some of that. Uh, a little bit of that play money. Exactly. The way I um, the way I like to think about it is I can't spend this capital. Like I'm I because I'm trying to capture the value that I create. So anyone that's out there is working for a boss, is working for their clients, is working. So you're all everyone's working for someone. So why not work capture the value that you're creating and lock it down um, so that you have something in the future, right? Just pretend that that super doesn't exist pension doesn't exist you are you need to be the one that's going to do this uh, and then you capture that value plonk it into an investment plonk it into an investment um, so that future future joe has something to be back uh, you know backing himself up um, that's how i like to kind of think about it is capturing value storing the value because you never know i have a we have um, a marketing i was just saying saying uh, off air we have this uh guy that does a whole lot of marketing right he's doing social media and he's like i create invisible shit on the internet i never know when this is going to zero it could at any point in time right now i'm making profit my business is going well um as an employee you it's going well capture that because you never know when you're going to get sick when you're going to get fired when something like that's going to happen and then you have a nest egg on the on the side there well, and, and the same you talk about that self-employed risk right business yeah. risk right there uh, I talk to plenty of people that are in salaried roles, PAYG, solid incomes, and I'm like, you are one pen flick away from mm. potentially losing your job. No, want to be negative. Uh, you've got a great career, for example. All it takes is a structural change in a business and you could be without a job. Now you get a redundancy, for example. You've got to find a new role. That could take some time. And they say to me, oh, well, investing in property is risky. I'm like, your corporate role is risky because your entire livelihood is dependent on this paycheck mm. versus if you can – buy a, and build a portfolio of five, six, seven investment properties, that potentially is replacing your income, your day-to-day -day income. Now your income on top can supplement more investments, pay off your mortgage, and now we're playing you know, a 10-year uh, game plan. It's going, this is how we extinguish the prime place of residence debt. This is how we build a portfolio. You can sell a few properties off, clear the debt, and then you get to the net passive income. And trying to get people on that journey at the very start, I feel like once they've got two properties under their belt, now they're subscribed to the philosophy. It's generally that first, second property that you mentioned at the very start going, yeah. that is an uphill battle. If you can just get past that, like the air is fresher up here and life gets just a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. It's very hard to take that first step and get to that point. Um, but it's just having the right people around. And that's the beauty of the Oz Property Investor community, right? Yeah. We have a community full of investors that have 5, 10, 15, 20 uh, properties in their portfolio that are giving out information um, to kind of help people grow and expand. Now, I think you do need to be very careful of what info, like we have a group, it's the largest group. So we do have a lot of like, not some, there's a, not great information. <laughs> this is one right? of my questions going, like, this, is, <laughs> this is the the beauty, but also a little risk that you've got when you've got such a large community going, yep. group think yep. can be slightly dangerous. Opinions, everyone's got them. Uh <laughs> And I, I've seen in the group and it, 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 I think take what you can from the group, yeah. take the energy from people that are willing to share, like the ones that have been there, done that. But then you see the questions like, where's the hotspot and what can I do yeah. here? It's like, you've missed, I think you've missed the point. If you're asking that question, you have missed the point in investing. So take me through when you're trying to manage a community and herd cats, <laughs> how do you do it? And how does someone coming into this group get the most out of it? Well, uh, so I, this group is co-founded by Jeff Miles. He is an absolute legend. He uh, previous previously a mortgage broker <clears throat> yeah. as well, multi-million dollar property portfolio, and we created this created this group together. Um, and he's very good at the admin and, and making sure that the the good guys are helping, uh, and then uh, the bad guys are out, not in the group whatsoever. Um, so we try and just kind of you know help conversations of if someone's giving like, hey, contact me. So don't go in our group and, as a professional and say, great, we're gonna 
contact all of these guys. No, you'll get booted out straight away. Mm. So if you're just joining into the group, just start like feel like there are no, there's not no stupid questions, but have a bit of a think. Like what are the challenges that you're facing with of understanding? How do you get into the property market? Um, listen to some podcasts and then formulate some great conversations, uh, questions off the back of those. So like ask better questions, get better answers. So if you're like, uh, you know, what one of the good questions would be like with, off the back of this conversation is what are the ugly ducklings? Like what are uh, the highest value returning transformations that we can do so if you came to me and uh, i found a property that has a hundred thousand dollar renovation i would say that's not utilization that's not utilizing the capital your time and energy and resources uh the best way so i would say maybe go for a renovation that's just a bit of a kitchen upgrade or a bathroom upgrade um or go for a property that has um two living rooms and that you can just put a wall up so the, uh, one of my first properties i bought two hundred eighty thousand dollars. we purchased it um i put a wall up I painted it. I did the flooring. I spent $22,000 on a renovation. Most of that renovation was done by a property manager. So we help teams organize these renovations. So yeah. as a busy professional, you don't have time to do that. You don't have time to fly to site and do, don't worry about it. Yeah. We'll help you. If we're taking on this project, we will help you through the whole thing. Um, so you can then have uh, a, a lower renovation, right? $20,000 $20, renovation. It got revalued at three hundred and sixty thousand yeah. dollars. So I put a dollar in, and I got three dollars back. So you should focus on those things that that. Uh, so that's a good question that I would be kind of asking off the back of this conversation. Um, but also follow people that have done have walked the walk. So for instance, Jeff and I. Um, so we run this group. Uh, we have just recently. This is probably uh, this is an announcement actually. So we're yeah. creating. Uh, we're creating a pro Oz property portfolio where we build in public. So over the past 30 days, we've bought $2,070,000 worth of property. Exactly. So that's three different assets and three different types of properties in three different markets for all different reasons. Uh, and we're going to be building that portfolio in public and everyone's going to be able to understand what, how did you do it? How, like what, what are the steps that you took all of the going through all of this? And then you'll see the real numbers. And uh, I think it's going to be really cool because that's that's what I want to see. I want to see the real world of people that are actioning it. And it's the same yeah. with you. You're on, when our, we had our conversation. You said something. Like, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was like we're all doing this together. I am in the trenches making this happen. And that's they're the type of people that you want. You don't want to be going with those guys that are saying, "Oh, look, buy thirty properties and retire on the equity over this period of time," because those days are gone. Oh, Apple yeah. rules have changed. The game has shifted. Yeah. It's, it's now what are the people doing right now, building those portfolios right now to be able to just grow and scale. But they need to be in the game. You can't just like that's a really good question to ask any of these professionals that you work with. What is your portfolio? What is your strategy? So I would chat to as many professionals as you can to gauge um, the best way I would say to get professionals, uh, to get the best professionals is just to um, uh, say, what, what are you doing? What's your portfolio? Not just what's your portfolio, but also what are the clients that you work with? So when you're when you're in this community, uh, reach out reach out to people and say, great, you know, who who is using a mortgage broker? What's the broker? Um, who's using an accountant? Uh, and actually uh, make sure that their incentives are not aligned. So why are you referring me to this person? Do you get a commission or a kickback? Yeah. Because anyone that I work with, I get no commission, no referral, no kickback. Because as soon as I get five hundred dollars for referring someone. That sh that that kind of like shades the advice. Is the information you're giving me because you're getting a kickback, or is it because you're actually interested in helping me out? And look, it could be it could be very well above board, and they're great professionals working together. It just muddies the water just a little bit. I don't know. I think we're probably a bit similar like that. I don't know yeah. heaps of professionals that we work with. It's like it just adds a layer that doesn't need to be there yeah. in a relationship. Yeah. And I just think, yeah, for it's, me, why? It's why incentives. The need? Like yeah. what, what did Warren Buffett say? Find find me the incentive and I'll find you the the, the problem. Like yeah. this guy's the best mortgage broker. This guy's, this guy's Aaron Christie Davis and the team. And then this guy gives me 500 bucks. Who my business is incentivized to take the 500 bucks, but then the client misses out on the – the, the best brokers the out there, part, right? Yeah. The strategic focus. So, uh, yeah, those are some of the conversations. How do you get paid? Um, who are, uh, like, what kind of strategies do you implement? Oh, well, we buy scalable property portfolios in the existing space. Or, well, most of my clients are house and land packages. They're probably not the best people to be doing mm. with. So I think it just comes down to a lot of conversations to build that A-team. 
Um, and it usually comes from word of mouth, the best people. Like the, the challenge that I'm seeing is when people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook ads, they've got a funnel, right? Oh, totally. uh, like they've got a hundred thousand. Like I, I run Australia's largest property investment group. My buyer's agency, we work with eight to 13 clients at a time. And then we focus in on those clients to get the best results. We could easily turn this to a thousand leads in and a thousand properties. But the challenge is it's so very hard to buy investment properties that I can't find um, enough properties to be able to serve that many clients. So we focus in on the client and give them the right brief mm. uh, because otherwise you're just, you're just um, – Thousand clients in, thousand rubbish properties out. Yeah, so you just need to be belt, yeah. conveyor belt. Exactly. So with those people that are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, they need to get that return on investment. And they need I mean, to churn break, through yeah, the numbers. They're break even. I mean, I got no qualms at the business model. We see it. When you that when you're balls deep on like that much marketing, you've got to then get the return on investment right, and that means you're then hiring a team, and it's like a real it's a real churn and burn uh, approach. And yeah, uh, no judgments. No, we don't throw stones when we live in glass houses, but just more to say, if you want a little bit more of that beast folk, if you want a bit more of that, I'll be closer to the action with yourself, Joe. You oversee it, for example, or a really good BA in your team, that's, that's a different business model that you're looking out for. That's why we say, look, do your research when you're talking to buyers agents, when you're talking to brokers, uh, any professional. It's like they got them, they got their team, they uphold a certain standard or level. Just be very, just be very choosy about who you're picking as part of your team and. Like you said, I think, have they been there? Have they worked with it? And look, sometimes professionals don't have to have done for itself. It's a client. No, yeah. He's a dentist. I'm like, he doesn't have to have a root canal on himself to understand how to do root canals, right? True. So uh, for me, yeah, don't don't base your entire judgment on have they done it for themselves? Have they done it for plenty of clients before? And that could also be a very, very good question to ask as yeah, well, mate. Solid. Hey, buddy, I want to say thank you very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Like I said, respect for what you guys are building. Respect for putting your portfolio in public. Like well, this yeah. is well, this is a this, <laughs> this is, is nowhere to hide. This is a combo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there is nowhere to hide. Yeah, but no, this is this is not mine. Like my entire portfolio. We're doing an yes. Oz property portfolio. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's true. Actually, I uh, I mean, I look at the results that we've got clients, and I'm like, well, we'll, we'll just do it in public instead of of uh, of just for the clients. We we'll just show them show them what it. And what, that's what I think doing. people will people will respond to that because. It's not just, hey, we're going to pick out our high-performing uh, you know, case studies. Yeah. It's like there's going to be good, bad, ugly. There's going to be you know, different performers at different yeah. times as well. And um, coming off the Olympics, mate, there's some that will come out of the blocks really quickly and there's some that will find their feet at, you know, <laughs> uh, in the latter part. So, mate, credit to Appreciate you. Appreciate it, mate. Great work. If, you. you've, uh, mate, if you found this episode helpful, uh, if you know someone that's on the, on the journey, particularly around they've got their home, they've got equity, what we're dubbing lazy equity, and they want to get into the investment property, uh, journey and that first you know couple of steps are their hardest share this episode with them we felt that this might just really open the door to knowledge and again if there's a partner that you're talking to that isn't exactly engaged up to the level of uh, knowledge that you are share this episode and let's get them on the journey with you as well that's a wrap for another episode we'll talk to you soon